Hey guys, how you doing? It's been a while since we've sat down and we've had a chat and everybody's talking about AI and its future on art and photography. So why don't we have a chat about that today? Within the last week, it was just announced that Microsoft invested a further $10 billion into OpenAI. Now, OpenAI are the people that make DALI and of course, ChatGPT that everyone's talking about. Now, of course, there's other auto art generators such as Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. And in fact, about a few months ago, maybe six months ago, I did a video on Midjourney, uh, kind of showing you how it works, how to use it, and a little discussion at the end. I've kind of updated a lot of my thoughts since then. So having, you know, six months playing around and digesting this technology, I definitely have developed some different thoughts on it than I had back then. Back then, I just kind of didn't know what to think. And for those of you who don't know about these AI engines or artificial intelligence, give them a text prompt and based on that text prompt, it can produce art. So you could, you know, describe something or you could describe a scenario, say it's a cold day in Memphis and it will create art. You can also direct it to create art in the style of a modern artist or, an, uh, you know, or Da Vinci or Giotto or, you know, a pop artist, maybe Andy Warhol, and it will generate art in that style. And as far as styles, it can do everything from cartoon, hand-painted, uh, photorealistic, you know, photographic, it can look like 3D renders, and you can tell the AI all of these things and direct it in creating art. Essentially what it's doing is you're becoming an art director and you're with these text prompts telling it, hey, this is what I want you to create. So we always thought, you know, with robots and, and technology, you know, they're going to do mundane tasks so we can sit around and create art and take photos. I thought one of the last things that would ever be replaced is the arts. But yet here we are today where this AI on anybody's computer or anyone's phone even is able to create art as good, if not better than most artists. So it can do visual arts. ChatGDP can also do written where you can you know tell it hey write me a story and it can write a very convincing story in fact just recently i think it was a week ago they said it just passed the exam at wharton business school and of course even in the areas of music ai is in there and now it's creating songs but let's focus on photography and digital art because this is kind of what our niche is here so to kind of figure out where we're at why don't we take a quick stroll through human history so initially, humans were able to start building tools and things out of stone, and this enabled us to do things that we couldn't do before. And then, of course, that went on to the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. We were able to start building different tools and inventing things, and eventually this led to the Industrial Age. And then came the Industrial Age, where we were able to elevate beyond just creating tools into creating machines. And these machines were able to mass produce things. They were able to bring down the cost of living um, at the same time, raise our living standards and provide us with a lot of the things that we enjoy even till today. Now, there's good and bad to all of these, of course. So one of the good things about the industrial age, it actually doubled the life expectancy of the average person. But one of the things about the industrial age, of course, is now a machine can work more efficiently than a human and requires less skill. You can kind of see where I'm going with this. So there's a term that we use for people that are against technology and against progress, and that's a Luddite. And this actually came around the time of the power loom. So there were highly skilled textile workers that made a good living and were very good at what they did. And they had these workshops where they created textiles, which is what cloth and clothing were made out of. So then what happened is these power looms, they started building factories and they were able to produce much more textile. And because of this, the prices came down, the workshops couldn't compete, a lot of them closed down, the workers went to the factories to try to get work. And of course they couldn't all get work because number one, they didn't need as many workers because of the machines. And number two, they didn't need such highly skilled workers because the skill needed to run these machines was much less than the skill needed to create these things by hand. And so the legend goes that the Luddites were named after a guy called Ned Ludd. Now, apparently Ned Ludd never actually existed, but it was a good folklore to kind of get things motivated. And then the Luddites actually mobilized and went around smashing machines. 
and to the point that the British army was actually fighting against them. And at one time, believe it or not, there were more British soldiers fighting against the Luddites than were fighting Napoleon at the time. So eventually, you know, they were suppressed and, you know, everything just kind of moved on. So then we go from the industrial age, then we move into the information age where computers come along. Now, remember, computers also replaced a lot of jobs. So during this time, you know, there was a lot of people that were doing things that were very labor intensive that were now being automated. Even like today, you know, things are being automated and replaced by machines. Machines are much more efficient. They're cheaper to run. They produce more. They don't need to be fed. They can't go on strike. There's a lot of reasons, you know, that it's more efficient to use machines. Now, as more machines come along, less people have work in those areas. So let's go back a little bit, you know, and then we'll move forward. So movable type was invented, um, you know, which is, you know, the printing press. And before that, there was people, scribes, that used to write. That's how they made their living, by writing these books. All the books were created by hand. Monks, scribes, wrote all these books by hand. That was their job. So then the printing press replaced them. But look at the new opportunities that came out of that. So out of the printing press came, you know, people working in printing press. There were printers. Now there was newspapers came about. There was, uh, you know, bookstores, you know, and that's kind of interesting, um, you know, and then so a lot of people were working in the print industry and that created jobs. Now, of course, a lot of that is starting to diminish now and it's being replaced by digital and online. But think about that. Now we have a whole IT industry. We have whole new jobs. I think about what I do as a digital artist. I wouldn't have my job if it wasn't for computers. Now, one of the interesting things about the industrial age is this brought about these massive cities that started to build because now people were coming together um, because it was possible because of this technology and also they were coming together to work and build things. Now, where we are now, we're in a different place where now that's being demarketized and we've already seen this happening. This is not new as far as outsourcing. Um, now everybody in the world competes for the same job. So it's not necessarily someone next door that's competing for your position in IT. It's, it could be someone in India. It could be someone in Ireland. It could be somebody in New York. It could be, they could be anywhere. And that's kind of changed things where literally now because of the internet, we can live and we can work anywhere. The restriction comes that, yeah, there's less jobs in this particular area, but new jobs have opened up and also new opportunity have opened up. All right, but where does that go for us as artists? Because, you know, photographers, let, let's look at photographers for a second. Okay, so I actually started photography when we were using film. I was predominantly a graphic designer for a living, but I was making part of my living, part of my job was doing photography. And I would go to events and I would take my camera and I would load in my film and I had a very specific skill set. See, here's the thing. I couldn't look on the back of my camera and, and see like, oh, my exposure, everything's right. No, I had to learn the craft. I had to know the settings on the camera. I had to understand what was going to work and what wasn't going to work where I could hire myself out for a job because you can't go and shoot a major event and then go to develop the pictures and none of the pictures came out. That's, that's not a good look and it's not a good way to make a living. And a lot of photographers will nod and say, yep, you know, wedding photographers will, will understand that, right? So there was definitely a skill set required um, to take photographs. Then along came the digital camera. Has that changed photography? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we go to every event, you know, there's a, you know, a, someone's got a digital camera, everyone's got a digital camera, everyone's got a phone. Yes, but now that everyone's taking photographs with phones, is that taking away the art? Or is it making the artist obsolete? I don't think so. I think the fine art photographer is still going to have a place because that level of expertise and that level of skill to create that piece is beyond what the average person has with their phone. Not just that, but a lot of the photographs are taken are throwaway photos. Like when I go to a hotel, I take photos of my room number. 
so I know what room I'm in. I take photos of the menu at a restaurant so I can just look at it on my phone. It's much more convenient. So the camera has become a tool which is more than just fine art and documentation. But let's, let's look at this professionally, maybe as a working artist, graphic designer, illustrator. So people that used to do illustration were replaced by a camera. Does that mean illustrators are gone? Let's go all the way back. Does that mean stone workers are gone? No, there's still people working with stone. There's still people working with steel. There's still people creating hand handcrafted goods. So as designers, we've been using props for a while. For example, stock photography. Okay, so there was stock photography, which was rights managed license before we got into royalty free. And having licensed stock photography as part of my job, I can tell you there's many times where it would have been more cost effective to have just gone photograph it myself or sent a photographer out than it would have been to use the stock photography. Of course, now with royalty free, it's become very cheap. Now that doesn't mean that stock photographers don't have a job anymore. And, and notice I'm going back there, I'm talking about stone workers, you know, steel workers, photographers, there's still work. I'm going somewhere with this and this will apply to Photoshop and what we're doing in a second. So while we're working, we can use stock photography, but then there's other things we've been using, overlays, assets, templates. So we've been using these things to aid us in our work and it hasn't put us out of work. And in fact, the design digital art industry is probably bigger than it's ever been because of the advent of new technology. Because now a lot of things are going from print to digital to online. You know, so we're, we're looking at things like iPads, phones, we're looking at websites, we're looking at apps, we're looking at ads, social media. So now there's more demand than ever to create these digital assets. All right, let's bring all of this in for a landing and wrap all of this up where it all kind of comes together and makes sense. This is what I think. So if we look at AI art that is able to generate what people need, will it replace the digital artist, the photoshopper, the photographer? And I say, no, I don't think it is. When I first started using it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. This can do this. Why do I even need to learn this crap? Well, there's some limitations that I've kind of noticed and yes, it's getting better. And you know, they say, you know, it's get, I mean, like say mid journey, it couldn't do eyes before, you know, now it can do eyes perfectly. Now it can't count. If you look at hands, teeth, toes, you know, you, you'll very often get 10 fingers on one hand or a hundred teeth in a mouth. So there's definitely some areas where it has to improve and it will get better. Now here's the thing. It's not going to get perfect overnight because there's that whole principle of, you know, 80 to 20. That last 20% is going to take way more time and way more computational power than the initial 80%. So, you know, it's like you learn an instrument. You're going to learn some chords and stuff on a, you know, a guitar. I've got guitars here. You can learn some chords very, very quickly and you can make progress very, very quickly. But the further you go and the better you get, the more difficult it is to make more noticeable progress. So, one of the things I found is that AI art is capable of generating some incredible things, but it cannot generate what I see in my mind. If I have a picture or a vision in my mind, maybe I can draw it or I can find someone to draw it and then I can feed it into the AI and that will actually get a lot closer to what I'm looking for. Now, if it's not perfect, you can't tell mid journey, hey, you know, rotate that person 45 degrees uh, and put a blue hat on them instead of a yellow hat. It, it can't do that right now. So this is where the skills are going to come in Photoshop. So you can take that AI piece maybe as a, you know, as a plate or as a starting place. And then you can composite over the top of it. You can move things around. You can change the color. You can change the hand into only five fingers. Now these things still require skill. So there's always going to be skill, but now you're applying your skill in a different place. There will be retouches in the future there. Literally their job is to retouch AI. Now there's a position that didn't exist. There were retouches that did commercial retouches of people, cars, shoes, whatever. But now we're going to be doing retouching on AI. We're going to be using AI to generate ideas and we might use those ideas as a basis for doing a photo shoot or for creating another piece of work. So AI is going to reduce the amount of digital artists that are needed. That's, that's a fact. 
Uh, am I excited about that? No. Can I change it? No. So what, what do I say to you? I say to you is get as good as you can. Start learning the AI. Don't be a Luddite and fight it. Learn it. Learn how to apply it. Use Photoshop with it. Use it with photography. Use it, you know, for backdrops, for photography. Use it for different things. Start to understand it. Start to learn the prompts. Start to learn how to use the prompts. And you're more likely to be one of the people that's going to be hired in the future to create and make things. All right, so what about the hobbyist? Well, as a hobbyist, this shouldn't change anything. If you're doing something because you enjoy doing it, it doesn't matter if a machine's doing it. Um, or if other people are doing it, it doesn't matter how well it pays or it doesn't. If just for the sheer joy of doing it, you should still do it. If you enjoy photography, do photography. If you enjoy design compositing, enjoy design compositing. Maybe use AI to help you with your compositing to create some of the elements so you're not searching for stock photography for hours and hours. You can generate some of those elements in AI, cut them out, drop them in, and put them together in your art inside of Photoshop. You know, and at the other side of things, there's gonna be new opportunities, new positions created. There's gonna be prompt artists. People's job is gonna to be to work with this AI and feed it with the right prompts to create what we want, to create different iterations. Um, and there's other jobs I can't even think of right now. But with each one of these major steps forward in humanity, because when I talk about AI, we're not just talking about art. You know, we're talking about robots, we're talking about self-driving cars, self-driving lawnmowers. You know, all of these things are real and, and they'll be more and more ubiquitous in life as we go forward. So AI age is upon us. It's going to cause a lot of changes. It might change the way we live, just like the Bronze Age, the Stone Age, the Industrial, the Machine, the Atomic. All these different ages have changed the way we look at the world, the way we live, where we live. All these things, you know, it, it, it's, it's the future and it's kind of, it's coming at us very, very quickly. And so my advice is don't fight the future, embrace it. You know, it is coming anyway. So learn how you can use it to improve your lifestyle. Because one of the things through each of these ages, the standard of living and the life expectancy of humans has gone up. So, you know, so rather than look at this from a dystopian point of view where, you know, this is it, we're doomed, this is the end. I prefer to be optimistic about it and look at how this can enhance our lifestyles. The new opportunities, new jobs that we never even thought of are coming. We're able to live in ways we're going to enjoy things that we weren't able to enjoy. We're going to spend less time doing menial things, more time doing the things we want. And so, okay, here's my prediction. What is going to be valuable in the future? I believe that handcrafted goods are going to be valuable in the future. If we look at, you know, the young people right now, so like digital natives, people, you know, born within the last 20 years, they always had digital with them. They always, you know, listening to music on iPods, never listening to records, never having cassette tapes. And trust me, if you've had cassette tapes, they're not that good. But yet the kids today are craving them because they want something tactile. So they want to have an experience. So, you know, saying, hey, and I, I won't say the name of my smart device, play this song, it'll just play that song. And if I want to hear it again, I'll play it again. But there's an experience in putting a cassette tape in, be it good or bad. You remember me, I'd hold it half down, I'd be like, and then you hear the gap and you're like, okay, there's the beginning of the song. And then you'll hear the song again. And then you to get, to get to the beginning of the song. You know what I'm talking about if you've used a cassette tape. And then of course it gets in the heads, they get dirty, gets all chewed up, and then you get the pencil out and then you, turn it on the cassette, and then you put the tape on it, you, you know, where it gets cut or it gets chewed, and then you're listening to your favorite song, and then there's this blah, 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 in the middle because, it, you know, where it got chewed, right? You know, and it's, it sounds warbly or whatever, or the record gets a scratch. So, so they're not perfect, but yet people are craving that experience as something real. So even now with photography, we've got digital cameras that take perfect photos. So young people are craving things like Lomo, uh, Holga cameras, things that have flaws. Wabasabi. Wabasabi is looking at the beauty in the imperfection, such as, you know, uh, one of my clients, David Lee Roth, says, you know, Wabasabi is your favorite pair of old jeans. I won't use the word he used, it's a little effed up, but they're your jeans. They're, you know, there's something special about them. There's something that, like, you know, makes them 
you know, that wabasabi is what makes them special. And so handcrafted goods, people in the future, you know, as we, you know, 3D printing and, you know, doing all the things of technology and everything moving forward, people are going to crave that handcrafted good, that pot that's not quite round, it, or, or that painting that's not quite perfect, that photograph that, uh, oh, it's got a little bit of noise, oh, oh, there's some shadow over there, you know, like these things are going to be what make people fall in love with handcrafted goods. So, you know, it's people, I, when we're living in a world of artificial perfection, people are going to be craving for the imperfection, for the imperfect, which is, which is us, humans, humanity. We're not perfect. We don't do anything perfectly. Everything is different. So handcrafted, whatever it is, you know, things that are handmade, I believe are going to have extreme value in the future. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. You know, let's open a discussion and two things I ask, number one, be civil and number two, respect other people's viewpoints and emotions because we're all at different places with this, you know, as we're changing and growing it, it's not comfortable. I'm not going to say it's wonderful and, you know, this is so great and so comfortable. No, it's uncomfortable. It's a time of change. It's a time of transition. Things are changing. Let's come together and support each other. And together we can forge the new way forward where we can create more beautiful things than have ever been created. So anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you're new, hi, this is Photoshop Cafe. Hit that subscribe button. Normally I do tutorials. You won't miss any of those if you hit that subscribe and turn on notifications. Anyway, I'm not going to ask you, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> Just thanks for watching, guys. Till next time, I'll see you at the cafe.